So first off, Delilah, as you know, is not only a biblical character, she is a late night DJ. How many listen to Delilah at night? If she's still on. I see one hand going up, that's it? My goodness gracious. So this morning we conclude the sermon series, Bad Boys of the Bible. And as one person kindly said to me, I'm kind of Old Testamented out. We go back to the other slide or go back. No, no. Keep <laughs> Next one. There we go. There we go. So the full story of Samson begins in Judges 13. We are again introduced to a very shady character. And yet we'd never allow the past antics of his life to define the present character of Samson. So read chapter 13. The story is a it's an eerie parallel to the birth of Jesus. The angel, not an angel, but the angel of the Lord appears to the women who will become Samson's mom. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, although you are barren, having born no children, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor is to come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from birth. It is also, it is, it is he who shall begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now, there are quite a few stories in the Bible that go from barrenness to blossoming. You think there's no hope at all, and all of a sudden, boom, a child is born. Or there's hope that appears. Sarah was barren, and she gave birth to Isaac. Barren Rebekah, Isaac's wife, gave birth to Jacob and Esau. You know, there's a long history of God seeing what we are not able to see in people or our world or our neighborhoods. To quote St. Paul, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. See, our vision is also limited, and our vision is limiting at times. God helps encourage us to look beyond what we see. God sees beyond the horizon of our heart, our hurts, to offer a day of healing and promise to each of us. And God asks each of us to look beyond what we see, for what we see today is temporary. It's not just today. And the trouble we have is we make decisions based on today and not the long term of what might be out there, what is promised. And that's the struggle of faith. Judgments are made about people without incorporating how God might use folks to accomplish the Lord's will. So, anyway, Samson is born, and the next thing we know, he is in town of Timnah. And there, the beauty of a Philistine woman catches this eye of a Hebrew. He tells his parents that he's in love. Start with the cover. Picture this. Got, uh... Yeah, I'm in love! I'm in love! And I don't care who knows it! Is that when you showed up at your parents' place? I'm in love! I'm in love! And I don't care who knows it! Well, the response from his parents is less than enthusiastic. The woman he falls in love with, is she's not even one of them. Isn't there a woman among your kin, among your people, that you must go and take away from the uncircumcised Philistines? How many of you remember meeting your spouse's parents for the first time? Was that a good experience? I don't hear a resounding yes, I'll tell you that much. So my grandmother, God rest her soul, tells a story of bringing home a date to meet the folks. This is the early, probably the 1918, 1920s, that kind of thing. And the first question out of my great-grandparents' mouth was, are you a registered Republican? <laughs> As one member of my sermon musings group commented, when I first met my future in-laws, there were four questions. What's your politics? What's your religion? What's your work? And how much do you make? <laughs> Reminds me of the scene from the movie Catch Me If You Can. How many of you saw that movie with uh, uh, Leonardo. Leonardo DiCaprio? 
He plays Frank Abernathy, who has a gift for forging checks and pretending to be someone he is not. He falls in love with the nurse. And on the night celebrating their engagement, the feds show up. And here's the story. I'm saying all this. But, uh, but I don't want to lie to you anymore, all right? I'm not a doctor. I never went to medical school. I'm not a lawyer or a Harvard graduate or a Lutheran. And I ran away from home a year and a half ago when I was 16. Right? Samson's parents had the same concern. Maybe the same question. What? What? She's not an Israelite? In fact, when I first had dinner with Jane's parents in Haddonfield, New Jersey, I remember this night clearly. Jane is Catholic, comes from a Catholic family. And her father, knowing that I was an ordained Presbyterian minister, asked me to say the blessing at dinner. Now, if you know the rote Catholic prayer, Blessed is the Lord, and these I give, we're about to see the bounty of Christ the Lord, amen. It's done like 10 seconds or less, so you get right to the food. But no, I'm Protestant. We don't have a rope prayer. And so I began to pray. And finally, her father, God rest his soul, interrupted me and said, Ed, the food's getting cold, amen. <laughs> True story. So you have Samson bringing an outsider into the family. Cultures, values, perceptions of life and living, they're so different when you bring someone from a different part of the world or a different part of the country or, or even a different neighborhood into the family. It's just a, an adjustment that has to take place. His parents try to talk him out of marrying this Philistine woman. He is so stubborn. He says to his father, Dad, get her for me. She pleases me. Now you can read into that whatever you want to. Somebody just did. <laughs> and throughout Judges 14 and 15, there are stories of riddles and temptations, unleashed anger, and hot-headed murder. I mean, this is a tale that you have to sit down. It's not a bedtime story for children. So Samson learns that the father of his betrothed, the woman that he loves, who's a Philistine, has given her to another woman. And Samson unleashes his anger again. He is thirsty for revenge. And it leads to devastating the town, both physically and economically. He just destroys what's in sight. And in response to this disaster, the people of the town burn his wife and her father to get back at Samson. Revenge has no end. There's some serious anger management issues at play here. And the tit-for-tat rages on between the Philistines and Samson. And Samson, from the tribe of Judah, they want to keep peace with the Philistines. And they're like, this guy's out of control. He is causing problems that we don't need in our lives right now. So in order to keep the peace, the tribe of Judah, a Hebrew tribe, in order to keep peace with the Philistines, they turn Samson over to the Philistines. You know what? If we give him to you, you just leave us alone. They say, what a great deal. They just want to preserve the peace. So he's handed over. So here is the Hulk Hogan of Judah wandering around the land of the Philistines, and they just hate him for what he's done. He's destroyed their towns, he's murdered their people, he's had his way with their women, and now they want their revenge. They want the ultimate revenge on Samson. What happens? He falls in love with Delilah. We don't know if she loves him. They seem to enjoy their relationship with each other. He feels comfortable enough to fall asleep at her place, and you know, they spend time together. And she's offered a proposition. Find out what makes him strong, and we'll each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. It's an offer too good to refuse. So the drama moves quickly. We read about it in the scriptures. He's tied with seven fresh bowstrings. They're not dried out. He's bound with new ropes, never used. His hair is woven in seven blocks with a web pin and loom. He escapes all three. He fools her on every single one, and she finally appeals with her love for him. There's a couple other verses. She nags him. He's exhausted. And he says, you know, if my head were shaved, then my strength would leave me. He falls asleep. She cuts his hair. He loses his strength. Samson tells her the truth. Truth has a way of initially weakening us, coming face to face with truth of who we are and some things we've done. 
But truth then has a way of making us stronger as we go through life. And here's the gory part of the, of the story. After they weaken Samson by cutting his hair, they gouge out his eyes, bind him in shackles. They force him to do, at that time, women's work. Now, before this, Samson was in control of his life. He was, he was strong. He was brave. He was invincible. Now he's humiliated. He's degraded. He's devastated. This one strong person is now the object of ridicule and laughter. Sometimes it's in our moments of greatest weakness that we find our greatest strength. Our greatest strength comes in the moment of our greatest weakness. When we experience God's grace, it often comes in the midst of things that seem to wear us down and just erodes us. Bill Wilson, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, experienced grace in this way. He said, I had tried drink to quit drinking. He was an agnostic. And Wilson consulted a friend who counseled him to seek God's help. Having been treated with hallucinogenic drugs in a hospital, Wilson went to his hotel room after a conversation with the friend, crying out in desperation. He prayed an unusual prayer. If there is a God, let him show himself. I am ready to do anything, anything. And according to his account, his room was bathed in a white light, conveying the presence of God. In his words, it seemed to me in my mind's eye that I was on a mountain and that a wind not of air but of spirit was blowing and then it burst upon me that I was a free man. The experience enabled him to stop drinking. You know, it's in the moment of Samson's weakness. He dies with the Philistines by pulling down the two pillars and killing himself and the Philistines together. Now, when I deployed to Iraq in 2008 to 2009, I went through a divorce. I wasn't sure what for work I'd have when I got back. I wasn't sure how my family would receive me. I got to tell you, when you are in control of your life, it is easy to believe in God. But when you don't know what your next job's going to be, where are you going to live, or how your parents receive you, or the judgments that will be there, and you're broken, it's really tough to believe in God. It is tough to have that faith. The strength of our faith is found in our weakest moments. And Christ is there to lift us up. We are broken and hurt, and we are made whole again. Thanks be to God. Amen.